good morning, and uh, thank you for that kind introduction. And this being a meeting about energy, I'm reminded of an introduction my friend David Roderick once received when he was uh, CEO of, uh, of U.S. Steel, and uh, they, of course, used lots of energy. Uh, Dave was introduced by a master of ceremonies uh, who uh, very briefly uh, introduced David and said that uh, he was one of America's most gifted business persons. And to prove it, the introducer uh, cited just one uh, very brief fact. And he said that David had made $10 million in California oil. And when David came to the podium, it was evident that he was uh, somewhat embarrassed. And he said, well, the introduction had been essentially accurate, but it was not uh, California, it was Pennsylvania, and it was not oil, it was coal. And uh, it wasn't 10 million, it was, it was 10,000. And it wasn't he, it was his brother. <laughs> and he didn't make it, he lost it. But so with that, thank you for the kind introduction. Uh, I've selected as my topic uh, uh, for the remarks this morning, uh, uh, putting energy into innovation. And of course, you can reverse those words and come up with another important topic. But my focus this morning is on the need for innovation, particularly in the energy field. Uh, probably I should begin by confessing that I'm not an energy specialist. I'm an aerospace engineer. But before you dismiss everything I have to say, uh, just remember that I am a rocket scientist. About a decade ago, uh, the U.S. House and Senate established on a bipartisan basis, if anyone can remember what that means, uh, on a bipartisan basis, a uh, group to assess America's economic competitiveness in this rapidly uh, expanding global marketplace. And our group became known as the Gathering Storm Committee after the title of our report. Our committee consisted of 20 members. Uh, they came from, they were presidents of both public and private universities. They were CEOs of a number of major corporations, a number of pres former presidential appointees, uh, three Nobel laureates, and so on. And on. Upon completing our work, two of our members joined the cabinet, uh, one as Secretary of Energy and the other as Secretary of Defense. And among the more important of our 20 recommendations was the creation of something called ARPA-E. And uh, it was, it's a the intent, as we saw, it was to fund promising research and applications and to assist in uh, uh, funding inherently risky but very promising uh, undertakings that may also require uh, proof of principle of the applications at scale. Uh, today, uh, ARPA-E is viewed, I think, by many observers as one of the most successful new experiments in our government over the years. Uh, thanks in part to uh, the work of many of the people in this very room. Importantly, uh, the United States uh, in recent years has been given a partial reprieve uh, during which it could invent longer term solutions to the energy challenges that we face. And I, of course, refer to the advent of hydraulic fracking, as controversial as it too may be and is uh, certainly not clean in the absolute sense by a long shot. Whatever the case, uh, it has given us a little bit more time to develop some of the more promising, longer term uh, uh, sources of clean, sustainable, affordable energy. Henry Ford uh, once said about the automobile that if you had asked people at that time what they wanted, uh, most of them would have said they wanted a faster horse. And that's exactly why ARPA-E is so very important today. Uh, what's needed are fresh approaches to the challenges we face, uh, altogether new uh, attacks on these issues, not just a faster horse. And it's reasonable to ask, and many have asked, uh, why industry shouldn't uh, uh, fund these undertakings uh, since they are in part the beneficiaries of the work. Uh, the primary answer to that question is uh, that 80% uh, of the CEOs of corporations in America have said that they would cut the R&D budget if necessary to meet the next quarter's projections. Uh, the root problem is that when I first entered the industrial world, the average shareholder held their shares eight years. Today, it's four months and declining. 
And under these circumstances, market forces are focused on the next quarter's returns, not the next decades. And Congress is interested more in the next two years. And this obviously isn't compatible with what's required to create uh, new forms of, of energy uh, and to demonstrate them, particularly at scale. But even when uh, research has been successful, uh, there are still challenges to be surmounted. There's the conventional valley of death that uh, faces almost every uh, innovator as they seek to progress from research uh, to uh, demonstrated technology, but unlike most fields, uh, the energy field often faces a, a second valley of death. And there, uh, I think the reason is that in the energy sphere, transiting from a, uh, a technology to a, uh, a proven uh, full-scale, uh, uh, economically viable uh, pursuit uh, is extraordinarily costly and very time consuming. Uh, consider the impact today of just one new development that's coming down the highway, if I might say, and I refer to the proliferation of electric cars. Uh, the Chevrolet Bolt now advertises a 240 mile range, uh, making uh, all electric powered vehicles uh, increasingly practicable. Uh, the notion of an all-electric fleet is viewed by many people with great optimism, and I think properly so. Uh, no more carbon-emitting internal combustion engines, just clean electricity pouring out of the electric plug into our cars. Uh, in thinking about that, I'm somewhat, though, reminded of an occasion when I was browsing in a used bookstore some years ago, and I ran across an early textbook that was dated 1900 on mechanical engineering. The first line in the book read, the horse is dead. Uh, if you wrote such a book today at the beginning of this century, you perhaps would write the internal combustion engine is dead, at least as it applies to passenger vehicles. But what's wrong with this picture? And I think the answer is, at least for openers, is that uh, some 65% of the nation's electricity, uh, currently, no pun intended, uh, is still derived from fossil fuels. And that's a share that's been very slow to change over the years. Uh, today, nuclear reactors provide about 20% of the nation's electric power, but six of these are going to be retired within the next decade, even though those six that are going to be retired provide more power than all of the uh, nation's solar panels combined. And that's certainly not to diminish the importance of solar power in any way, but it is to question uh, such things as should uh, the word nuclear be viewed as a four-letter word. Uh, unfortunately, too many of the nation's decision makers overlook the fact that there is no magic plug uh, with a power source, a clean power source behind it into which we can uh, uh, power our, our vehicles. And while truly clean energy sources, uh, such as solar voltaic or solar thermal or wind, wave, biomass, what have you, uh, are certainly important uh, alternatives to fossil fuels, none appear at this moment, as I would see it, to be a mainline source of power. And if old forms of renewable energy are included, such as wood and hydropower, uh, are to be included, uh, in spite of being subsidized, uh, they provide uh, less than half the total contribution of renewables themselves. And as attractive as these new sources they are, they're not without their own disadvantages that uh, range from uh, intermittency to cost to unique forms of pollution. America's uh, massive and costly and very long-lived overall energy infrastructure as it exists today is constituted around four primary energy sources, uh, petroleum, natural gas, coal, and nuclear. The cost and durability of the existing uh, infrastructure that supports these sources introduces an enormous impedance into the task of producing change. The nearly 100 quads of energy that uh, are consumed every year in the United States, uh, petroleum still provides about 35 percent, uh, natural gas about 28 percent, 17 percent from coal and nuclear about 9 percent. 
All the other sources combined are providing only about 10% today of America's energy consumption. Uh, the point being, we don't need marginal improvements. Uh, we need quantum jumps. And among the limitations of uh, many renewable energy sources, uh, as I mentioned, is their intermittency, which uh, uh, together with a growing demand for mobility makes energy storage a very critical facet of the challenge we face. In this regard, advancements in uh, uh, batteries uh, in terms of energy density, recharge time, and cost are badly needed uh, in terms of uh, technological true breakthroughs. And that's true whether we're talking about applications or handheld devices all the way up to the grid. What's needed are novel, disruptive uh, techno technological advancements. And unfortunately, uh, such advancements usually are not achieved simply by working harder at what we've been doing all along. More likely, they're going to come from places uh, such as ARPA-E. And indeed, when it comes to the subject of novel energy sources, it's not as though we lack uh, fundamental opportunities. Uh, in the Pentagon, where I used to work, uh, this might be referred to as a target-rich battlefield. Uh, we've learned to engineer microbes uh, to produce energy, and microbes don't take vacations or ask for raises. Uh, new materials uh, uh, offer many uh, areas of promise. However, the only long-term answer that I can foresee, long-term, uh, to meet the Earth's uh, baseline energy requirements uh, is nuclear fusion. But when I was in graduate school, uh, they were working on the Project Matterhorn at Princeton, and I should say that when I was in graduate school, gasoline cost 19 cents a gallon, uh, except during price wars, if you can remember them, uh, when it dropped to 11 cents a gallon. And I asked the scientists who were working on Project Matterhorn at uh, Princeton what, uh, how long it would be before they had uh, commercially available uh, power provided by fusion energy. And, the answer I was given was 30 years. Well, not very long ago, I was working on a project for DOE, and I asked the uh, scientists at Fermilab what they thought, how long it would be until we had nuclear uh, fusion provided electric power on the grid. Their answer was 30 years. And more recently, I was amused to see a newspaper article quoting an executive at the National Ignition Facility, the NIF, as saying that, uh, and I quote, in 30 years, we will have electricity on the grid produced by fusion, absolutely. So uh, I guess the good news is we haven't lost any ground. <laughs> uh, I just never realized that like E, C, and pi, 30 is a universal constant. <laughs> now, of course, not everyone forcefully agrees with this assessment. Uh, it appears to be an issue more of funding and politics as it is of science and engineering, or at least as much, and uh, that's, has to be one of the great uh, important aspects of ARPA-E is to try to be a non-political organization. A lot's been accomplished, uh, hydraulic fracking, electric cars, ARPA-E, uh, but as the investment bankers are fond of saying, uh, past performance does not uh, guarantee future results. And with regard to ARPA-E, the uh, authors of The Gathering Storm had envisioned an organization that today would be funded by at least a billion dollars a year. Uh, but perhaps most damaging to the kind of work that RPE does is turbulence and funding and the lack of continuity. And uh, one simply can't grow flowers if you periodically pull up the roots to see if they're healthy. On an occasion uh, a few years ago when I was testifying before the Congress, uh, before a committee of the Congress, I was seeking more money for research and education. And one of the members who apparently had become frustrated with my frequent appearances for these purposes uh, interrupted me and he said, Mr. Augustine, don't you understand that our country has a budget problem? And I responded uh, probably more succinctly than judiciously uh, by saying that I was indeed aware of that circumstance, but that I had been trained as an aeronautical engineer. And in my career, I had worked on many airplanes that during their development programs were too heavy to fly. And never once did we solve that problem by taking off an engine. <laughs> and everyone in the room thought it was funny, except for one person. <laughs> anyway, uh, innovation is one of those issues and one of those engines, as is ARPA-E. 
And with those opening comments to kind of set the stage, uh, let me ask Jason to come out and join me and maybe we can have a little informal conversation. Jason? Of course, a real pleasure to be able to pose some questions to my friend Norm Augustine. I've had the uh, pleasure of doing this a few times over the last couple of years, and I will tell you that his answers get better every time. And so um, I'm looking forward to today. Before uh, posing a couple of questions, just wanted to um, just say a couple words about this event. Um, it's tough out there. I think most of you are aware in the world of bipartisan policy. We spend a lot of our time at the Bipartisan Policy Center these days focused on the question of how does one support and protect the kind of core institutions that have enabled our country to be so successful. And I think it's worth recognizing that there are institutions beyond government that are equally critical. Um, institutions of creativity, exploration, curiosity, and optimism. And I think those are really alive and well in this room um, more than almost any room I get to sit in. And so it is gratifying to have a chance to be here because I think it really does speak to the fact that there's a lot of potential, even in these difficult times, to solve the tough problems. And so I want to thank you all for your contributions. So Norm, um, in your remarks you mentioned that the Gathering Storm report was in fact authentically bipartisan. And innovation has always been a topic that has you know, kind of transcended the tribalism that has become so toxic these days. And I guess I want to know how you think the innovation issue is navigating the political shoals and what we all might be able to do to protect it? Well, it's, a, it's a good question, Jason. I, I think my, my elevator answer to the question would be that uh, at the time of the, since the time of the Gathering Storm Report a decade ago, uh, we've advanced from uh, indifference to antagonism. And uh, that's a disappointing summary. Uh, at the time we did the, uh, the Gathering Storm report, uh, truly it was a very nonpartisan environment we were dealing with. The committee was set up by both the House and the Senate, uh, both Republicans and Democrats, and uh, we had good support. And to try to maintain that, we focused on issues that we thought were broad interest. And we didn't focus on the glories of research, although I think one certainly could. Uh, we focused on the impact on jobs for the average person of uh, the work that research has done. Uh, we focused on uh, the quality of life of the average person of energy research in particular. And uh, it, it worked very well at that time. We had broad support. Uh, many of our recommendations were uh, implemented, uh, RPE being just one example, you know, one major example. Uh, since that time, uh, I think not so much because of energy issues, although certainly uh, uh, that's some of the uh, environmental issues and the likes have gotten coupled and have had an impact on funding and energy research. But I think that uh, other issues that uh, range from uh, all the tax structure, R&D tax credits to bring uh, foreign uh, uh, profits back home uh, all the way to uh, immigration issues have created a divisiveness in the Congress such that today uh, we face a much more difficult problem in uh, supporting research. On the other hand, I think there is an underlying uh, understanding of the importance of research. And uh, I think we just have to do a better job of telling our story. And uh, that requires everybody in this room to uh, uh, you know the story so well, and the, I think the, one, maybe one of the places we've fallen short is that uh, too many folks uh, in the public think of people doing research as uh, doing something irrelevant to their life in the back room wearing a white jacket, uh, a white robe, and uh, cleaning test tubes or something, and uh, that, that's such an incorrect uh, perspective. Uh, what, what's done in research fundamentally is impacting people's lives today, and it's going on around the world, and it's awfully important we do a better job at explaining that. And as a, a moment of optimism, I think uh, in part due to your leadership, I do think it's worth recognizing that about half of the Republican Senate voted 
to increase the RPE budget last time it was given that opportunity. So it's good to see that at least on this issue, we're sustaining some of that collaboration. I want to ask you to reflect a little bit on just the basic question of risk. In my imagination, a lot of what RPE and government's role is, is the kind of strategic promotion and management, and in some cases, reduction of risk. The NIS and AS has praised RPE, particularly for the kind of white space off roadmap investments. But our political system, as you incline, is inclined towards incrementalism. I think um, we've discussed before that if a, a venture capitalist is right one out of 10 times, they tend to have a summer home. And if uh, DOE officials write nine out of 10 times, they risk indictment. And so I think the, you know, how do you see what we can do to protect the innovation process across the government? Yeah, I, innovation, uh, Jason, as you suggest, is uh, part and parcel to the willingness to take risk. And uh, particularly in, in science, but more basic work, uh, you, you never know where the breakthrough is going to occur. You, it's true, true throughout history, from Rentkin's work to Fleming's work and so on. Uh, today, uh, I think one of the difficulties we have is we talk about taking risk uh, and don't talk about the, uh, the potential rewards. And any given project might not have a huge reward, but that's why we have portfolios of projects in, in ARPA-E and elsewhere. Uh, the, uh, the, some of the uh, challenges that have occurred uh, relate to this lack of coupling in people's minds between you've got to take risks to get big rewards. And, well, I, I think of a, uh, I was at a, uh, a lecture some time ago, and the, the person was making this very point, and he made it in a way that I thought was so compelling. He, he called somebody from the audience up and said, uh, I've got an imaginary I-beam laying on the floor here uh, that's about 40 feet long, and I will give you $20 if you'll walk across that I-beam. Will you do it? And the fellow in the audience said, yes, of course. And so the Lecturer said, if you take the same I-beam and put it between two 40-story buildings suspended over a highway, same beam, I'll give you the same $20 Will you walk across it. And the guy says, no. And the lecturer should have quit. He kept going. He said, okay, now supposing I'm on that building over there and you're on this building here, and I'm holding one of your kids out over the edge, now will you walk across it? And without hesitating, the guy said, which kid do you have? <laughs> and so, there's this issue of being sure that uh, we do couple risk with, with potential reward, and it's very difficult to do. I always think of the problem with the FDA. Uh, if the FDA uh, lets something get through that's damaging, like thalidomide, uh, they get beat up terribly badly. Uh, if they don't let anything through, you don't hear much about it. And a, a good bureaucrat will figure that out in about two minutes, uh, what the strategy there should be. So we talk a lot about the kind of role and partnership between the public and private sector, and you alluded to this in your remarks, that the issue of short-termism is changing the culture of private sector investment. If you can reflect back a little bit on your experiences making some of those risk choices, I'd love to see if you have any stories you might share. But how do you respond to the argument that private, or that public investment is essentially crowding out what the private sector should be doing? Yeah, I, I think that's uh, just dead wrong that people argue that uh, public investment crowds out the private sector. I think that the public uh, sector is doing things that are uh, public good, and that's why we have governments, uh, uh, things that the private sector either won't do or can't do. Uh, the two working together is a very powerful combination, and other countries in the world have figured that out, uh, that you can't be adversarial. I spent 10 years of my life in government and another chunk in the private sector. And uh, the power of working together is great. Uh, the power of not working together can be very damaging. And uh, I think of, a, you said, you mentioned stories in my career that I think of uh, the company I used to work at, we thought we had some great opportunities in what I'd call applied research. And, we were so excited about them, uh, we went to, uh, we sent the president of the company to Wall Street to brief the analysts there uh, on the opportunities we had and, and we were going to double our investment in uh, research. 
which was a, not a huge thing in terms of amounts of money as it is to the U.S. government. The basic research is two-tenths of a percent of the GDP. Anyway, we, he went to brief uh, on Wall Street, and I gave our briefing about how excited we were, the, the opportunities. And the audience, uh, when he finished, literally got up, ran out, and sold our stock. And our stock dropped 11% in four days. And I happened to see one of the analysts who was a friend of mine a few days later. I said, what did we say that was wrong? We think this is great. And his answer was, that, uh, don't you understand, uh, your average shareholder at that time holds your shares eight years. And they're not interested in what happens to you a decade or two from now. Uh, and they surely don't want to pay for it. And he then gave me the coup de grace and said, uh, uh, Norm, our firm does not invest in companies with such short-sighted management. Those were his exact words. And uh, that's, I, I think, just a fact of life we live with uh, in this country. And so uh, the role of government is so important to lay the seeds. Now, industry, it's clearly up to industry to take those seeds that are proven, or the small plants, and, and move forward. Uh, that's not the role of government, in my opinion. But uh, industry just won't and can't do uh, the, the front end things uh, at any great scale. And anyone who questions that, uh, look at Bell Labs or Xerox Park or uh, uh, GE's Connected, you can go down the long list, uh, the difference between what they were when I was a young engineer and today. I just want to press a little bit on the kind of the sapling question, because you also noted in your remarks that there's almost a second valley of death unique to energy due to the scale issues, the capital costs, regulatory uncertainty. And that's really where the controversy has been. You know, how far down the kind of innovation trajectory should government exist? Is, do, you, do you have a way to think about that? I mean, people think there's this kind of hermetic separation between kind of basic and applied research. How should RPE be living in that um, messy space? Yeah, you, you define the problem well. And I think the, the challenge you run into is there's, there's no bright line in the sand. It's a, a continuum. And so one has to make decisions somewhat on a case-by-case -case basis, and that's never a happy circumstance for people who are interested in setting clear policies. At the same time, uh, uh, it, it's quite clear that the front end of that, bit, uh, that spectrum basic research, that's going to have to be mostly funded by the government, not necessarily done by the government, or in particular often not done by the government. And that's one of the great things about RPE, I think, is it, it serves, uh, it funds ideas outside. Uh, but uh, the second valley of death where you try to take a, proven technology uh, in the laboratory, if you will, or in the engineering uh, uh, sphere, and uh, go to full scale, uh, that is so costly, so risky, and to prove the economic viability of what you're doing, uh, certainly we would never have gotten from uh, nuclear weapons to nuclear power had it been up to industry by itself to do that. And so there, there are these cases. I can't give a magic formula uh, other than to say that uh, I would err on the side of having the government do more of the front end. Uh, but uh, there are those cases that, you know, this is not like a lot of areas of research uh, where you, once you've proven it in the laboratory, that's probably enough. Uh, here, you've got to know is it going to work at scale. So, one of the things about RPE that many people in this room appreciate is that it is also structured somewhat differently than the you know, kind of whole of DOE and other agencies. On the American Energy Innovation Council, which we host and you chair, there have been a number of suggestions that we try to kind of extend aspects of the RPE management structure to other parts of the government. Um, do you think there are real opportunities there? Yeah, the, when we were first uh, came up with the idea of creating an RPE, uh, we, our thoughts were not particularly original. Uh, we had in mind uh, ARPA, which has been so successful, and, uh, or DARPA as it's called today. And it has some features that are particularly attractive when you're trying to innovate. Uh, one, it became a place that uh, uh, talented, uh, dedicated people wanted to work. And it has a very flat organizational structure. You don't have a lot of layers for approval uh, 
processes to ferret their way in. You have uh, a, uh, a turnover in uh, staff so that you don't go stale. Uh, you keep bringing in people with new ideas. Uh, a great deal of liberty in what one works on and uh, the ability to make decisions very quickly. Uh, I think back to the very early days of ARPA. I was in industry and there, ARPA put out a uh, proposal, an RFP, to uh, uh, do a rather major study of ballistic missile defense. And the entire response time was 10 days. And on the 10th day, you were to appear in New York, it happened to, for your orals with your uh, briefing. And uh, they awarded the contract on the 11th day, and there were no protests, I might add. And that was the kind of ability that they had to make decisions quickly. And that's the sort of thing we had in mind with ARPA-E, was uh, an organization that was unfettered by uh, the conventional uh, uh, procurement regulations that, uh, where judgment could be exercised, where risk could be taken, and uh, where credit could be given for success. So I think we probably have time for one, uh, one last question. And I want to end where you began, thinking about kind of the role of government in supporting this enterprise. Um, one of the um, members of the cabinet who has been most attuned to aspects of public-private energy investment uh, is Secretary Tillerson. Um, I think one of the other members of the cabinet who clearly understands and cares about this is Secretary Perry, who is generously, I think, going to be joining us tomorrow. And like many cabinet secretaries, he grapples in a difficult budget environment. You know, we have heard many people working um, at DOE talking about the critical importance of ARPA-E, and yet that is not reflected in the president's budget proposal. So we have a short note for you to tape to the podium for Secretary Perry uh, when he gets here tomorrow. And I'm just wondering if you might um, write it in front of all of your friends here. <laughs> That's called a what setup, you, I think. What, what, would, what, would you, what would you share with the Secretary? I think I would say that uh, the uh, economy and the national security of this country uh, depends on research and education uh, as their foundation, uh, more than anything else. And research and education both have a common feature, and that is that their payoff period is very long. And that's a period that's not compatible with industry's investment strategy nor uh, with the political strategy. And so it will take a, a great deal of courage and effort to uh, uh, continue to sustain uh, research base in this country uh, to the extent that other countries are improving their research base. And so uh, I would just ask that you continue uh, to make the case for research, uh, be a spokesperson at the various highest levels in our government. Uh, for the importance of research. And uh, if one has any doubt about the impact uh, of past investments in research one need, or in education, uh, one need only uh, look at uh, the benefits we have today that didn't exist uh, even 10, 20, 30 years ago because uh, the research had not yet been done. And so I, I would thank you for your service and uh, wish you well. I hope you stay around the full tour. Graceful as always, Norm Augustine. Um, I want to thank you because, um, as I think many people know, you really have been, if anybody can um, be described as the anchor of our nation's innovation commitment. And um, we're just delighted that you're sticking with us. So well, Jason, you. you're too generous, but thank you very much. And thank all of you. You're the heroes of this. And uh, it's, uh, you know, if, if, to quote a biblical term, if uh, you put your... Uh, candle under a bushel, it'll set the bushel on fire, or something like that. Uh, we need to get out and tell the story. Thank you for all you do in that regard. Pleasure.